Good morning, Lighthouse. So glad to be here. Um, as we enter into worship this morning, I want you to focus on the first verse. When I came in this morning with Rob to practice, and I thought, well, look at this verse. It says, strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, like multiple times waiting upon the Lord. That's how it feels sometimes, right? And I don't have that strength, but I believe that we will receive that from the Lord together. So let's enter into worship. You can stand if you wish or just uh, remain seated. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong this morning. I don't know if mine is, but it's getting there. Um, this next song, um, Wake My Soul. You got to tell that soul. Come on, soul. Time to get up.
seated. Hi, good to have you here this morning. Uh, I want to start off by wishing you um, happy Labor Day weekend. I know you had a lot of, of different things that you could do today and you chose to be here. Actually, you know what, as I say that, doesn't that sound like Southwest Airlines? We know you have a lot of... And, and the really crazy part, when I got my surgery a couple weeks ago, as they're wheeling me, this is the really crazy part, as they're wheeling me into the, the where they're going to do the surgery on my shoulder, I'm, I'm a little bit fuzzy already, but the guy goes, we know that you have a lot of different options that you could choose for, for your surgery. You could go to, to UC Davis, you could go to Dignity Health, we're just glad that you chose Sutter. And I'm going, this sounds, no joke, it sounds just like Southwest Airlines. <laughs> well, I, again, I'm thrilled to have you here today because I have been having fun on this series called My Secrets. And this morning, uh, I'm going to be connecting you with actually two people who have secrets, and the secrets are, I'm desperate. And we're going to unpack that, but I want to do it first by... Uh, talking about famous pairs, because we are going to be talking about a pair of people today. And isn't it interesting how often pairs show up in TV, in media, you've got, and you can maybe come up with some of these too, you've got uh, Sherlock and Watson, you've got Romeo and Juliet, you've got Johnny Carson, uh, this really dates some of you, you've got uh, Johnny Carson and Ed, Ed McMahon, you've got uh, Han Solo and... Chewbacca, come on, go on. Uh, how about Ron Weasley and Hermione? Yes, I pronounced it badly. I'm, I'm, it's, it's my age and my shoulder, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, R2-D2 and 3PO, what other, see, I'm, I'm, 
it's, it's my shoulder, you see. It, 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 it's the drugs. It's, it's something like... Uh, what other great pairs? Laurel and Hardy. That's right. Uh, if you're into history, FDR and Harry Hopkins. You know, part of his... Uh, part of his inner cabinet there that people didn't realize, but Harry Hopkins was FDR's counter. <laughs> How about peanut butter and jelly? Um, ham and eggs. Actually, out here it's more like bacon and eggs, isn't it? Any other uh, famous pairs? What's that? How could I forget something connected to Disney? Absolutely. I would have said Bugs and Daffy, but that's, that, that's another side. Well, what, what we want to do is I'm going to start with prayer, and then Leanne is going to read you the story of this pair that um, we really don't think of them as a pair together, and we definitely don't think of them as famous. But you're going to see how their stories connect, and I think it's going to be kind of cool. And then Rob and Lena are going to come back up and lead us in, in one more song. But first, would you join me in prayer? Uh, Father, there is something about pairs that help define a story. They're kind of like a, a picture frame where they really are helping us focus on what's going on and, and the most important things. And in a way, we need that framing of a service like this this morning to kind of separate us from all the other noise and all of the other things going on in our world so that we can take that giant breath and step back and, and allow our souls to um, be ministered to by you so that we can boomerang back and, and declare your glory, declare your praise. So help us frame up this morning as we listen to the stories of these people, uh, if there are things that are especially on our heart, um, help us think wisely about them today. Help us to set aside what we need to let go of and, and keep front and center what, what you would have us look at. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Leanne? Good morning. This is a reading from Mark chapter 5. When Jesus had crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come. Put your hands on her so she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned to the crowd and, and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding around you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. 
you to understand. They said, why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, while this commotion and wailing, the child is not dead, just asleep. <laughs> they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished.
Good morning, Lighthouse. Glad you guys are all here this morning. Um, I just wanted to remind you guys, this isn't on either, right? I'm not, okay. Um, I just wanted to remind you guys of a few things in case you don't know how to read or don't choose to read the newsletter. I'm just going to, some people are more verbal learners. So um, I wanted to let you know that the Harvest Festival is still on track. Um, Mr. Jim Ramsey is going to give us a more thorough update next week, and he's going to recruit people more specifically for roles. But just wanted to give you a heads up. Keep that in your mind, October 23rd. And also, uh, youth group is meeting every Friday now, 6 to 8 o'clock here at the church. So if you are between the grades of 6th grade and 12th grade, we would love to have you join us on Friday nights here at the church. And then also, um, women's group has um, taken a break for a while. Uh, most of the women of Lighthouse are involved in Bible study fellowship. And so we decided instead of trying to have divided hearts between a really good ministry and another really good ministry, we decided that we would let you, we would not make you choose. So, uh, but with that, we will be kind of moving to a new thing where once a month the women are hoping to get together and have fellowship and maybe talk about what we're learning in BSF, but even if you're not part of BSF, please come. It won't, it won't feel like you have to be included in one to do the other. So anyways, we'll give you updates on that. And then also, um, I don't know how familiar you guys are with the Covenant, but the Covenant has an incredible world missions program. And every year they send out a little prayer calendar and we got ours in the mail and I was enjoying it. And I was like, why am I the only one enjoying this? Maybe other people at Lighthouse would enjoy it. So um, I'm gonna put this out on the table right out there. You guys can peruse. And if you're interested in getting one of your own, please just let me know. The Covenant will send you one at any time. So I can certainly order one for you. But, and then there's also just an update. So this is the World Missions Prayer Calendar and this is more specifically just our um, just the like home missions and other updates that are going on. So I will leave that on the table for you guys if you want to peruse them. But that's all for now. Okay, kids, you guys are excused to Sunday school. Have a great day, guys. I love my doctor. I really, really do. The, the surgeon, uh, I went in, and first of all, thank you, those of you who've been asking about how I've been doing. Uh, the only reason I'm wearing all of this padding is because Leanne has been slugging me a lot, and it just kind of protects me a little bit. No, uh, but I do love my doctor. Oh, one more thing. Uh, because of my classes have changed, uh, coffee with Phil, it's something I do every, uh, well, once a week at 10 o'clock. I was doing it on Wednesday. We're moving that to Thursday. And always love to have you join us in that. Um, 10 o'clock, just go online. You can find me there. So back to my doctor. My doctor looks at the x-ray. He goes, oh, it's looking, it's looking good. And, and I trust him. Did you know, though, that 2,000 years ago, that instead of telling lawyer jokes, people told doctor jokes? I'm not making this up, this is true. That people just, they made fun of doctors. Of course, you, part of the reason you know why, uh, their fees were too high. Uh, doctors were often called unskilled barbers. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And here's another one that uh, if you uh, were visiting a town and if the leading citizen in town was a doctor, you shouldn't stay there overnight because if you did, you might wake up in the morning without a spleen. Yeah. Now, there, the, the illness that the lady has in what Leanne read this morning, it actually wasn't new. In the Babylonian Talmud, when the Jews were in Babylon, uh, doctors there had come up with a, a remedy to deal with that kind of, of discharge. L listen to this. Here's how it went. Let them, the women, procure three kabizas, uh, six liters of, or six quarts of Persian onions. Boil them in wine, make her drink it, and then say to her, cease your discharge. <laughs> but if not, if that doesn't work, she should be made to sit at a crossroads, hold a cup of wine in her hand, and have a man come up from behind her and frighten her 
and exclaim, cease your discharge. Yeah, this was somebody's idea of something that would work. But his last remedy for this, it's the worst. Uh, she must go <laughs> and fetch a barley grain from the dung of a white mule. Yeah, I'm not making this up. From the dung of a white mule and ingest it. Who would suggest that? And can you imagine writing it on her chart? Oh, my goodness. Doctors need two competencies. First of all, they need to be very, very good at what they do. Very good. But they need to also have this capability to understand, to feel along with their patient, to almost take on their pain. We call that, what, having a good bedside manner. Good physicians do that, that there is something that, that happens when a physician almost takes on the pain of their people. Well, uh, we're going to be talking about a physician today, a, a, a great physician, and I want to introduce again to you this famous duo for me in Mark chapter 5. And we have thought about them as standalone people before that they were just two different stories. And that really isn't how Mark intends us to, to pay attention to this. Because here's what you see. Two different people are afflicted by diseases. The number 12 connects them. We're going to hear about the 12 years that the woman has the, the discharge and this is a 12-year-old girl. And the other thing that we're going to see is that both Jair Jairus, the father, and the woman are desperate. And that's what I think Mark really wants us to see is that Jesus is the incomparable healer for, for really desperate people. Let me say that again because I think it is so much the big idea. Jesus is the incomparable healer for desperate people. So with that, open up your Bibles, if you would, to Mark chapter 5, or, or find your phone someplace. And we're actually going to start mid-story with the woman. Mark chapter 5, verse 26. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's pretty simple. It starts this way. She suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors, and she spent all she had. <laughs> uh, you get the sense that Mark wasn't so thrilled with doctors either. Uh, she'd spent everything and had nothing to show for it. She probably had a condition that doctors call uh, menorrhagia. And what that is, is it is abnormally heaven, heavy and persistent or chronic painful menstrual periods. And causes were due to abnormal blood clotting, um, uh, disruption of hormones, disorders of, of the endometrial lining of the uterus. But the longer it goes, it creates chronic anemia. And that's been going on now for 12 years. And that lets us know what she looks like. Uh, if you look at her, her skin is yellowish green. Her fingernails are curled up. Uh, we know that there is great pain because with chronic anemia, there are cracks that, that develop around a person's mouth. And over time, her eyes announce that paranoia is setting in. Again, another trait of of chronic anemia. And the saddest complication of all is the loss of touch, both literal and relational. She's become one of those people that you look through. They become invisible to everybody around them. Well, you can't hide secrets like that kind of disease in a village. Her family would have been advised or warned, instructed to refrain from lying in her bed, sitting on the same cushions that she sat on. If they did, they would have to go through an expensive purification process and have all of their clothes laundered. Learned men were forbidden to speak to her or even walk alongside her. Now, if you're her 
imagine the toll that would take on one's psychology, on, on one's life. Her illness would have prevented her from getting married if it occurred during puberty. If it happened later, it would likely end in divorce because there could not be in intimacy in a marriage, and without intimacy, there could not be children. And so she lives a very, very solitary life. And the historian Josephus, he explained that women like her were not allowed to even be part of religious or the spiritual festivals or feast days. And they couldn't even walk around in the park around the temple. Imagine, can you get this? Imagine the shame and the sense of isolation that she is dealing with every day. How do you picture her? Had she been a beauty? Probably. But now she totters as she climbs those limestone steps of Jerusalem, and there are a lot of them. And that's another symptom of the disease, that people get very, very wobbly. As she walks, it looks like she's 85, and she's probably closer to 35. When do you give up trying to fix yourself up? When do you just give up? But she's not the only one desperate in this story. Now let's slide back a few verses and pick up the rest of the story. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. The story of the woman is really the bookmark tucked into a larger book. It's a, her story is the subplot to something that's already going on. If you've ever been afraid for the life of your child, you can understand how all of this feels. The closest thing I ever got to it was one of our sons ingested some sort of, of poison and we had to take him to the hospital. And, and as I'm driving, I'm, rem I, I, I'm desperate going, God saved this little boy's life. And, and this is nothing, what I went through is nothing like this, but I can grasp it a little bit. Come, save my little lamb. And Jesus agrees and like a pedestrian ambulance the, the entourage races down the old alleyways and streets on their way to his home. And like can happen in Jerusalem during a pedestrian rush hour, they're stuck there. Traffic slows to a standstill. And all of that traffic opens the door for the encounter with the woman. So what I want you to do is I want you to feel what it must be like to be this dad in this moment where you're going, my daughter's life hangs in the balance and I can't do anything about it. Verse 24, a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. She's desperate, all right. So desperate that she has contaminated this spiritual leader. Yeah. In their world... To even touch his clothes meant that now he would have to pay the money for the ritual bath and have his clothes laundered. Is she being self-absorbed? Yeah, but isn't that what happens with chronic pain? Pain does that to us. At once, Jesus realizes the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? The air has to be crackling with emotion because it's almost as though Jesus is, is confronting her 
And Jairus is standing over the side going, what the heck is going on here? My daughter is dying. Why are you taking time with this woman? And that's a little bit of the point, that Jesus sets aside the frantic urgency of this respected religious man to take care of this woman, the see-through woman, woman, who's had this going on for 12 years. This is not an emergency. She's not going to die from this. Why are, you stop, why are you stopping to take care of her? You can pick her up and you can help her find her cane. That's all right. But for goodness sake, my daughter is dying. Verse 32, but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. And you need to pick up something in the text. That small little phrase, kept looking around, it indicates that it isn't just Jesus turns his head one way and the other. He seriously is looking around, investigating the crowd. And I can just picture Jairus beating his chest with his fist, going, come on already. Now, let me color in one more detail of, of the profile of the woman with a blue crayon. When she touches him, the text indicates that she is trying to grasp one of the four tassels attached to the bottom of his cloak. That's something that observant uh, Jewish observant Christian men, uh, I'm sorry, observant Jewish men would would have on the bottoms of, the, of their clothes. Those tassels, each one of those tassels stood for, for the, the, the commands of God. The tassels were also attached to a blue cord that indicated the mysterious presence of God. And the belief was is that if you had a prayer to be prayed, what you needed to do was grab onto the tassel of a holy man and make your prayer and like magic, it's going to happen. That's what's going through her mind. Jesus is a holy man. If I can just do this, it's going to magically happen. But pick up what Jesus says, because this is so important. He said to her, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So it's not magic. I possess the power to heal you, but you acted in faith, and it was your desperate trust, your desperate faith that moved the slender muscle of God. Hold on. This is a woman who has not been at temple for at least 12 years. So, so she's not been in religious services. And she's not been a righteous mother giving forth children. She's not attended Torah school. She's not even spent a shekel on other poor people. She's been just taking care of herself. Yet that Jesus stops to take care of her, it shouted volumes. Because in this moment, everybody around would have said, well, Jesus had the obligation to take care of the needs of a righteous Jewish leader and a man. And Jesus doesn't do that. He instead says, I'm going to show concern and compassion and respond to the desperate plea of a woman who really has nothing going for her except for her desperate trust in this moment. And this tells us something very important about the character of God, that God is not particularly impressed by religious performance, by compliance to the rules. Instead, what he is paying attention to in the life of each person is the honest, desperate trust. And this is important. I, I need to really make this point and I would not have understood this several years ago, but in living in India as we did, for so many folks, they thought of religion in sort of a transactional way. Well, if I do this, 
then the gods will respond and do their part. And it's kind of a, you, do, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. And that's how they understood life, their religion. If I light my candles to the gods, the gods are going to turn around and, and grant me luck or grant me favor. And the Jews in the first century thought a lot this same way, that, that if I fulfill all of these duties, then it is going to up my chances of getting my prayers answered. And when Jesus stops and responds to just her desperate plea, Jesus is flipping that whole idea around. And what it's saying is that the frequency of God's heart is tuned to the frequency of a desperate person's heart. And it has to be changing up how they understand how God thinks about prayer. Can you get a little bit of, of how this is changing their thinking that, that this Jesus pays attention or defers to the needs of this woman among, uh, above the even more desperate pleas of a frantic father? Well, like I said, in, in this moment... I can't help but picture what must be going through Jairus' mind. Instead of Jairus, that's hard for me to easily kick out, let's call him Jerry, because he would have been a guy like, like so many of us. Come on. Why waste your time with this bleached bag of bones? She's not dying, but my daughter is dying. Well, finally, they take off in a dead run. And only to come face to face with Jerry's huffing and puffing friend, let's call him Stu the tailor. And you can tell by the look in Stu's eyes that the news is not good. Jerry, we are so, so sorry but your daughter's gone. In that moment, the sobs and the wails would have been bouncing off of the stone walls of Jerusalem. Can you picture it? Can you feel the, the devastation he must be going through at that, that moment? It's not important that they race home any longer, and so this grieving little entourage makes their way slowly towards home. By the time they get to the home, the hired mourners, and that's what was always done, is that you hired mourners, professional mourners, to come in and cry and wail. They're already there. The plans of are being made for the washing and the anointing of the girl's remains because she needs to be buried by sunset. Please, Jesus says, one more moment. Might it be possible that I could pray over her? She's not been rescued from a coma. Let's give them a little bit of credit. They could tell the difference between a coma and real death. And because Jerry's name is known and he is the leader, a respected leader of a synagogue, it would have been easy to track the story, did it in fact happen, because Mark, being probably the earliest gospel written, was very, very close to the time of Jesus himself, and so I'm sure that people heard the story of Jairus and his daughter again and again and again, and it could be verified. But what I want you to see is that the woman and Jerry, their stories are really meant to be seen as intertwined. Like I said, they both start with disease. What connects them is the number 12. And both the dad and the woman with the discharge, 
they're both very, very desperate. And it brings us back to, I think, three insights that, that Mark really wants us to have on prayer. And here's the first one. And find a pen, write this down. I find this very encouraging for me. First, a desperate trust activates the power of God. A desperate trust activates the power of God. Jews in Jerry's world were used to praying multiple, multiple times a day. And what happens with that is subtly over time you get the sense that if I do my part, God's going to do his part, and I go through the motions. And what this begins to say or teach them about God is that there is something in the DNA of God that is especially tuned to desperate people when they pray. It moves the muscle of God. And it doesn't require that you be someone who deserves it because she doesn't deserve it. And that Jesus shows a, prefer a preference for her over the man of stature, I think is very telling for us. The heart of God is for the desperate who reach out to him. Second, <coughs> excuse me, Christ works according to his own timeline. The first is a desperate trust activates the power of God. Second, Christ works according to his own timeline. It would have been possible for God to step into this woman's life and heal her at any point in the previous 12 years. I'm sure she prayed. I'm sure her family prayed. But our time is not God's time. And he waits until her prayers connect in with the prayers of the Father and the need for Jesus to begin to tell his own story. God works according to a, a, a different frame of time. And this is helpful because it teaches me not to shrug with, with unbelief, not to sink into unbelief when my urgency is not God's urgency. That there are times when I need to be praying and trusting in his character rather than my calendar. Does that make sense? Because if I know that God is a good God and he is for me and that my prayers he is going to respond to, his work may not be according to my schedule, but his work is there and it is good and I can trust in his character. He has other plans that I may not grasp at the time. And here's the third. The drapery of death is not a veil that limits his response to our prayers. I know that's a long one. I'll read it again. The drapery of death is not a veil that limits his response to our prayers. In their world, like ours, we see death as such a final thing that when it happened, why should we bother to pray? She's gone already. Jesus has this ability to reach beyond what they saw to be a curtain and do something that they couldn't imagine, bring her back to life. And this had to blow their minds because it changed how they thought about prayer. They thought prayer was like that transactional thing that you do this and you do this and you do this and then God's going to respond. Well, now what they're learning is that death does not limit how God wants to answer my prayer. That God hears my prayer and he may be involved in bringing things about that I can't even imagine because prayer is far more powerful and mysterious than, than I usually realize. Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 34 Paul gives us this, this amazing, amazing insight. In verse 26, Paul says that the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf when 
we don't know how to pray. Now think about that. That, okay, I am a desperate person. I don't even know how to get words around what I'm praying for. And that the third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, comes alongside and, and adds his own intercession to my prayer. But Paul doesn't stop there. Verse 34, Paul says that at this very moment, the second member of the Trinity is interceding on my behalf before the Father. Both intercessions are talking about beseeching the throne of God, and that, and, and that transforms prayer from something small to something that, that all of who God is is somehow involved in my, my prayers. And so that what looks like a curtain to me in death, it doesn't have to be just that. And just this past week, um, Susan and I were praying uh, for her brother Dan. Uh, he was very, very sick, and he passed soon after. But as we were praying, Susan, we have the confidence that our prayers go beyond the end of his human life and we were trusting in God's provision and his work and blessing of Dan on into the future. Prayer is this amazingly powerful thing that involves all of who God is. Well, what does this mean for us? Well, Jesus is the great bedside physician of God. He has the power, but he also understands my limitation. He understands my pain. He, he understands the things that are crushing me. And he understands the kids who I'm desperate for when I pray because they break my heart. Or the guy at work that I really, really care about and he has just left his wife and I, and I pray in desperation. My heart aches over that. And what I read is that this physician somehow understands the passion of my heart and he answers my prayer somehow in connection with my desperate plea. And then remember I said that we need to trust in God's character more than we do our calendar. That he is bringing things about as a result of my praying that maybe I can't picture in that moment. But there are going to be connections that he makes and results that he brings about that may take 12 years or they may take a generation or your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren, but God is faithful to respond to the prayers of his people. And so we pray. And last, um, what we call death, it may limit me, but it doesn't limit him. And so we pray. Uh, Tony Campolo, and I want to lead us to a time of communion here. Tony Campolo uh, talked about when his Sicilian father and mother came to the United States and they were in church. And Sicilians are kind of cousins to Italians and, you know, they talk with their hands and, you know, they're always gesturing like this. And they were in church on a, on a Sunday morning and it was time for communion. And they were sitting behind a young woman and as the pastor was speaking and inviting people to communion, to, to take part in communion, she broke into tears. She started crying. Well, they didn't know what it was. But the trays started getting passed from person to person. And the trays came down her row. And being good Sicilian people, they're kind of nosy, they're paying attention. Of course, they're supposed to be praying, but they're also watching. And the trays are coming down the row, and the tray gets to her. 
and she waves it off and keeps crying even a little bit more. Nobody knows what to do. I mean, what do you do when you're passing it down and somebody knows, goes, no, 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 no. How are we going to get the tray to the person beyond her? I mean, who knows what you're feeling? So the person was just holding it for a moment. And Tony Campolo's dad goes, taps her on the shoulder and goes, take it. It's meant for you. Take it. She was probably like, the woman who didn't think that she was deserving of God's blessing. The table of the Lord is meant for us. And it doesn't come to us because we deserve it or because we're perfect or we're compliant. It comes to us because we're exactly not all of those things. But the God of the universe sees me. And he loves me, and he loves you, and you, and you. And he says, come on close. Let me invite you to a feast. A feast where I'm welcoming you as my friend. Not because you always deserve it, but because I see you the way my father sees you. I see you complete. I see you healed. I see you well. This is for you. So how I want to do communion today is uh, do it like we did last time. Uh, I want you to feel no pressure whatsoever. But at the time that, that you feel ready, come on up and I'll hold out the elements to you. Um, if, if you don't come from a, a, a Christian background, a, a Christian understanding, here's the background for it. That the last night that Jesus was with his disciples, these are people that he had been with for the last three years, he invited them to a, a special meal. And towards the end of that meal, he said, here, I want to, I want to start something that I'm going to want you to reenact and practice and practice and practice each year as part of your faith. And it's going to involve a cup of, of wine or, or grape juice and a piece of bread. Very, very simple things. And here's what they need to remind you of. That when you run out of strength, like bread, I can be your strength. I will provide you with strength and life. And the juice part, when you partake of that together, it needs to remind you that I am God's arm reached out to you in this world. I have offered up my life for you. And when you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, it needs to remind you that I am the strength for your life and I am the hope for your life, both. And so um, I'm going to pray, and when you're ready, come on up, and then you can take these back. Uh, I'm going to so love when COVID is finally over and we can do real communion elephant, uh, elements, but you can... Elephants, wasn't that a strange... That is embarrassing. Uh, but you can peel off the cellophane and the, or the little piece of plastic on the top and take the bread and, and drink from the cup right where you're at, remembering that Jesus is my life and Jesus is my hope. Father, as we get ready to practice communion today, the Lord's Supper, the, the Thanksgiving meal, I want to picture it as though um, we're friends and family members of the woman who was healed. Because later on, she would have been taking communion. And chances are, so would Jairus and his daughter. And we sit amongst them, and 
we remember that you are the great physician of the Father. And that your heart is tender to those of us who come to you in desperation for our health, for our jobs, for our families, for our friends who ridicule us or for those who break our heart. But as we come, we trust that our prayers don't fall on dry ground, that you take them and you answer them and even death will not limit them. So Father, as we partake of these elements, uh, we do it in your presence and we do it in remi for reminding, but also celebration. In Jesus' name, amen. So whenever you're ready, come on up.
Brothers and sisters, it has been good to be with you in the house of the Lord, and I can begin to understand why David said, was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Um, do you have one last song for us? Two last songs. Wonderful. Lead us on. Let's go out with something a little different. Um, this idea of um, eventually us coming out of that grave. 
you know, unless the Lord comes back first, I mean, we're all going to die someday, right? Um, but there will come a time when we all, when those who follow Jesus will be resurrected and will come out of that grave. And um, no matter how we might feel right now, this is, this is the reality that we have to, lo have to look forward to. And I think it's worth celebrating, don't you? Yeah. All right, let's. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was mine too Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was mine too Till I met you, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day, you called my name. Sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. Let me pray. Father, we want to end our service with those words that have ended church services for centuries. Now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine in the church, but also far beyond. To him be honor 
and glory and worship forever. And may he raise you up and prepare you. May he give you joy where there is sadness. Where May he give you confidence where there, where there is fear. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and grant you his peace. And God's people said, amen. amen. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bridge. Bridge.